So these are the points I'm going to uh, talk about, uh, just a working understanding of leadership. Um, to do this, I started with a blank screen and just talked to, I'm going to tell you what I think um, constitutes leadership and then when encountering a crisis, different than steady state management and operations, um, a crisis is a special uh, situation that requires a more rapid decision making, typically with limited information. Um, there's the concept of solving problems and making decisions at the heart of leadership. Uh, there's also the idea of involving contributors and partners and inspiring them. And then I'll go through some of our crisis here in Tompkins County and our experience. So again, my notion of leadership starts with two words that we should really focus on, responsibility and accountability. Um, the leader, the actor, needs to be responsible uh, and then also, I believe, accountable for some um, elusive objective. If it was easy, it would be in the realm of a, a routine manager's responsibility. Uh, typically, there's the requirement for other people to get involved. And moreover, I, I, I think the objective is um, must be consistent with some purpose or mission, particularly when you're working on behalf of an organization. I think that moves the organization. If you accomplish the mission, you're successful in your purpose, it's part of a struggle, moves the organization and the group that you're leading closer to some desirable future state, otherwise a vision. The vision is often what inspires. And so again, these are components of, of leadership. And the big one, uh, and this is a differentiation from management, I'm not gonna focus on this point, but a lot of literature about leadership and management is that leadership involves inspiring individuals to contribute and support the solution, right? The effort to accomplish the elusive objective. And um, I start voluntary because at some level, um, no matter how obliged the individuals are, um, good leadership invokes a voluntary commitment of energy and focus that's not a given, right? The leadership involves inspiring people to voluntarily contribute and support. And that role, a lot can be um, uh, said about that. It can be uh, certainly followers of, of a leader. Uh, it could be a teammate where there's a more egalitarian relationship with the players or even participants who give more than they otherwise should. And again, important part is that the followers, the contributors, the supporters are needed to accomplish um, the objective in question. And that's a key point. When you depend on followers for success, that is motivation in and of itself. And I think is part of truly motivating a group towards meeting an objective. I'll make a provocative statement. I understand my audience. I believe that being a doctor or any other practitioner in and of itself alone does not qualify one to be a leader in the sense of accomplishing elusive objectives by motivating other people. I personally have not observed the professional path of becoming a physician uh, to produce that as an objective of the education and training program. It might pay indirect reference to that, um, that quality, but I know that there's not, at least in my path, and I trained uh, medical school and residency at, at, at Penn, uh, my pre-medical um, uh, experiences in the sciences, um, that is not where I, I developed any leadership capacity. And I would argue uh, people need to seek out and uh, embrace opportunities to act as a leader. So when I talk to uh, physician audiences, I challenge individuals to seek out opportunities to be a leader by struggling, and struggle is good here, with situations where you're responsible and accountable to some elusive objective. It doesn't have to be your idea. It doesn't have to be a moon mission. It doesn't have to be something that's that's um, uh, out, of, out of one's reach. Um, in my experience, the early leadership lessons, and by the way, this can happen at any point in one's career. I see people taking on new leadership roles and challenges well into their uh, 50s and 60s, and I see some people in their teens acting as leaders, but typically the early opportunities are unpaid. Uh, I put a little note saying to invest. I believe that sometimes physicians don't invest as much in this uh, competence as they, um, they, they, they should, frankly. And elusive objectives have to deal with people. So I would say these uh, are skills you have to get comfortable with um, pursuing, negotiating, persuading, uh, assuring people, relaxing individuals, debating, disarming. There's a, a complex negotiation that happens when you're dealing with a group and you're leading that group to tackle um, an elusive objective, a purpose, 
bringing the group towards um, a better future. And so that's routine leadership. What about a crisis? Because the topic of my talk is when you're dealing with a crisis. So simple definition, it's a time of intense difficulty, trouble, or danger. And I think that it's, um, it's important to differentiate that from the normal struggles of a job. There's always problems that need to be solved, decisions that need to be made, uh, but a crisis is um, something that's uh, a little bit more intense. And I would say uh, it is different. If, if you're constantly in crisis, reevaluate your, your, your role or your position. Um, in my estimation, a crisis is a, a wider reaching problem. Um, Dr. Sammy mentioned the, the wide uh, reaching impact of COVID, uh, the fact that it could be a rapid fulminant consequence, that this can really move quickly, and often that there's fewer resources available to address this, or sometimes a lack of, of knowledge. There's a lot of books on solving problems and making decisions, and my the most important lesson to me was really about the tempo of decision making. So you know, identifying your problem, specifying objectives, alternatives, trade-offs, all of those, um, those terms in, in red uh, are really important, but um, it was influential to me when I was, um, I, I have a master's in strategic planning and national security because of my military role, when um, it was really framed with the, the time and information available being different for different kinds of problems. So uh, on the left side of the screen, uh, one of my favorite Malcolm Gladwell books, Blank, talks about reaction and instinct and the subconscious, and that's really important. You know, to me, that's either um, a disaster or an averted disaster. It's usually not a managed crisis. And then on the right side, which are more deliberate situations where you exercise the full realm of the full range of, of, of strategic planning, simulations, wargaming, economic study. Um, but in the middle, in the middle of rapid to more deliberate decisions and situations, um, there's the situations where there's a, a, a some amount of time, it's very limited, there's limited information, um, and you need to take existing models and paradigms and vary them. You take them off the shelf and then you modify and adapt them. And frankly, uh, the Cayuga response to COVID was uh, me actually uh, taking um, paradigms that I learned in my military career and adapting them to um, the situation at hand in Tompkins County. So in terms of gaining voluntary, voluntary contributions and support, again, contributions, you need people to play a role in actually achieving the objective. You need certainly political support and emotional support to deal with the crisis. It was always helpful for me to think about, well, who's impacted by the crisis? How many people are um, regarding what you're facing as a crisis, as a true crisis? How empowered are you to act in the moment? Do you need to maneuver for the authority that you would want to make the decisions and, and commit the resources to solve it? What are your authorities? What resources? What decisions need to be made? Again, what problem are you dealing? What actions are you permitted to take? Again, the time frame, the relative costs of action or failure with action and inaction. And then importantly, who else might act? Who are your competitors in the situation? What are their interests in the agenda? Who are the potential partners? Who can be activated and be in alliance? What are the risks and benefits of that? And then again, what do the, the neutral stakeholders and constituents want from potential actors? And indeed, we had a lot um, of stakeholders with COVID. I would argue our entire society was a stakeholder in how we were handling the COVID crisis in Tompkins County. In order to influence the voluntary contribution and support of others, Transparency is a huge key, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this concept uh, again. I think transparency by the leadership, the leader, and the leader's team is necessary for a number of um, things. One is to actually acknowledge the reality of the problem and the importance of a solution, right? So when you're motivating a group to address a problem, how real is that problem to them? Getting their attention, relevance, applicability is really key what specific actions are needed for a solution. So when you talk to individuals about how to get involved and be part of a solution, is there clarity around their involvement and a solution? This gets to engagement and ultimately ownership. That's kind of the highest form of involvement is where the followers or the stakeholders or the participants are actually taking up the challenge to solve the problem and you are guiding. And then I think what's really important is to be clear about the leader's motives and their own struggle. 
And again, people generally help causes, not people getting ahead. And so I think that's really important that the leader is committed to the cause, the leader's committed to the objective, the elusive objective at hand, not their own advancement. And so I think transparency about this is what is maximally motivating. And then just painting the vision. If you remember in my definition of leadership, it was about painting a vision of a future state that's desired. So that's some ideas about taking um, concepts of, of routine leadership and then applying them during a crisis. So in our situation, again, um, we were facing the same crisis that I think we were all facing at this time. Um, the COVID-19 crisis imposed a health risk that involved everyone in our society. I will argue that uh, very few people were uninvolved and whether you would be uh, a carrier, whether you yourself were vulnerable, whether uh, your business was impacted, whether you had to go to work in um, uh, unsafe environments or perceived unsafe environments, this really touched every facet of our situation. Huge lack of information that was really rampant initially. I think we know a lot now we didn't initially about some basic attributes of the virus and how it spread and what it was. Certainly action was needed and there was a direct impact on social activities that touched every other aspect of our society, whether it be people's psychology, physical well-being, obviously their economic. This is just a graph of the stock market having in, um, in uh, mid-March. I mean, this was really, we didn't know where this was going. And obviously we've seen the market rebound, but I think a lot of people thought they'd see the Dow in the, the mid-teens or lower. And uh, I think really uh, there was a huge panic. The government acted in totally unprecedented ways. And again, I have a, a master's degree in government. I've never seen such unprecedented uh, powers invoked in the name of public health, uh, health uh, stoked by a 24 hour news cycle that certainly thrives on sensationalism and anxiety. But if you recall, and we all do emergency declarations, mandated shutdowns and closures, public health orders, you know, uh, uh, quarantines and isolation were not routine parts of our uh, vocabulary, mandating masks and other restrictions. Certainly hospitals were uh, the most restricted part of our society in a lot of ways. Uh, and there was a promise. It wasn't um, a, a prediction. It was a promise that hospital capabilities would be overwhelmed. On the right, you see the, uh, the wave attacking the hospital system, Governor Cuomo's daily briefing. The top image, if you recall, ventilators being reallocated and transported by the National Guard between facilities, upstate concern that ventilators would be uh, reallocated downstate. Um, military ships, I mean, that is a, um, uh, it's an instrument of, of diplomacy really, but that is a military ship, the USS Comfort sailing into New York Harbor. I mean, these were uh, certainly um, the stuff crises are made of. Just moving on, supply chains frozen, real goods being jeopardized, uh, people uh, thinking vaccine would be two or more years away, the average was greater than four years from concept to implementation. Obviously the civil rest that was dealing, you know, on the right, I, this isn't a great picture on the middle right, but a lot of food rationing actually happened as well. And people really upset about that. The lower right picture was just illustrating the concept that healthcare workers went to work with some uncertainty. And again, hundreds and thousands ultimately um, uh, were either greatly sickened or, or died through the, the pandemic, but this actually um, was a real, I think, ethical and moral dilemma. So in Tompkins County, in terms of specifying what our objectives were, which again, the elusive objective is the, the you know, what is the problem to be solved? What are the decisions to be made? Um, I would say, you know, I don't know that we had this exact phrase written, but it was clearly to avoid or mitigate the impact of COVID to the greatest extent possible by protecting vulnerable populations, mitigating supply shortages, maintaining capacity and capability. There were many um, instances where I was in the public assuring the public of our capability and our uh, capacity to respond. And when things would get wor worse, we had uh, reserves and that we had PPE and that we were actually okay and that the healthcare system shouldn't be uh, avoided and that it was generally a, uh, a safe place if you had events like a heart attack or a stroke. And then ultimately maintaining economic activity in the community. And that was a controversial um, goal for a hospital to have, but that was our goal. And 
if you were able to maintain economic activity in the community, and I'll talk more about this, that presupposed all of the things above it on my list. And so really our goal as a health system was to open Tompkins County. Later on, I'll, I'll say it here just because I'm on this thought, um, I commissioned a group called Trust, Tompkins Reopening Under Surveillance Task Force. And it was a um, out of lane thing for a hospital to do, but we calculated that if the hospital and our health system and our community was successful, we would be able to reopen. And that presupposed that we were doing well with infection, we were keeping people safe, we were on top of protocols, we were educating. And so that was our far reaching goal, if you will. And we knew it, it, it involved a coordinated public health response that um, really organized the community's resources. Yes, it responded to infection rates, but it would we would be leaders in organizing the healthcare response. And so just a little bit about us, you, uh, most of you, I think, know, have a general idea where Tompkins is. There's a map of New York State next to the, the up here with Tompkins County. We're really just south of Syracuse, between Syracuse and Binghamton, 100,000 people with the colleges, home to uh, some really amazing higher ed um, uh, institutions, classic meds and eds between uh, the schools and the hospital. That's, you know, 60 to 70 percent of our economy. We're a sole community hospital, uh, Cayuga Medical Center, as uh, I was introduced as leading. We also have a physician hospital organization network called Cayuga Health Partners that leads about 45 private practices, and we're a very cohesive community. We're an ACO, so we're accustomed to working together, and we were we are a good ACO. We were the hot, lowest uh, lowest cost, highest quality ACO in 2017, and there is definitely a sense of the the medical community being cohesive and interdependent. So right out of the box, there was no competition for testing happening, vaccinations happening. We really worked as kind of a single unit, and part of our success was partnering with the public health department to do things in a coordinated well coordinated way. So we believed and we stated out loud that the healthcare establishment, the hospital, the physicians, the public health department should really be the leader. Um, again, we our vision was to focus on reopening and everything that that would entail. It meant hosting students in person, even if they went back to virtual. Cornell had a big decision that we strongly supported that they open and we helped them accomplish uh, testing. And then in general, we did our best to invoke the contribution of every person in our community to be a part of this and be behind us. Um, I wrote down some people wanted to contribute everything. Everybody wanted something done. Everybody wanted to support. There was a connection to um, the struggle. And I mentioned, you know, the struggle was really important not to hide it. Um, this is my one of my favorite poems. It was uh, featured in uh, a movie called The Gray. Once more into the fray, into the last good fight I'll ever know live and die on this day, live and die on this day. And I think there was that sentiment in the community that there were nurses who were risking safety, doctors who were risking safety, essential workers who were going out, people we were deploying into parking lots to test people in ways that we weren't sure the PPE was adequate and everyone was behind this consolidated response that was wonderful. So our area of focus, our leadership attention, if you will, mass COVID testing, and we really aspired to do um, a, a really fantastic amount of testing that I'll cover. We augmented public health with our resources. So without getting involved with cost, we worried about the costs and the economics later. We deployed 10 nurses to the public health department to call people back. We rapidly deployed almost 60 providers, some of which are on this call down to New York Presbyterian in New York City. There were a lot of reasons we did that. We rolled out manufacturing efforts we engaged um, custom manufacturers in the community and what was legitimately a World War II-like manufacturing efforts around masks that was not only useful to produce masks, but motivating for our, uh, our community. Uh, I mentioned the trust concept. That was the uh, Tompkins Reopening Under Surveillance Task Force. And we were really pushing the county government. So um, we actually presented that we would take the lead on this committee that would be responsible for reopening the economy. I think that really um, stimulated the uh, county executive and the legislature to move more swiftly. Um, there was active outreach at every point to local, state, and national legislators. At one point, we gave uh, Tom Reed, who's our uh, district uh, national representative, an invoice for $20 million. He still uh, laughs about it, but I wanted him to know that that was the economic impact and that it was his job to get 
federal relief to hospitals to cover our revenue loss uh, that we were enduring. And we presented a, a notional structure of the Emergency Operations Center where it would be a, a public health led uh, mission. Other out of the box efforts that are, are noteworthy. Um, I should have said what this means. This is the Co uh, Cornell COVID testing lab. We actually took the vet school, which has a, a regional, really a national uh, reference lab, but it's not certified for humans, obviously. And we actually put that under our license as a CLIA certified lab. Our human pathologists supervised and were the medical directors. And we converted Cornell's vet school into a human lab that subsequently delivered, I believe the number is at this point, 1.1 million COVID tests to the Ithaca community. We were a leader in developing with Cornell COVID PCR pooling. So I'm sure you guys appreciate the idea that uh, for surveillance testing, not high risk testing, but you can take uh, at the FDA level of uh, clarity, delivering a diagnostic result, you can take five samples and run with one at the time limited, still limited PCR resource. And we were able to uh, produce um, a lab that had the ability to do tens of thousands of uh, PCR tests um, uh, daily in our community. And then later our vaccine emphasis, we translated the mass testing capability, same operation. We operated out of the shops at Ithaca, empty Sears building, empty Bonton, empty parking lot. We were cycling up to 2000 vaccinations a day. And we, we peaked at, I believe 1500 samples collected in the parking lot of the Bonton and Ithaca. So these were the things we focused on. These were the elusive objectives that we felt were part and parcel of having a reopening chance in the community. I'll say just a couple of things about some of those efforts and give you some pictures. We um, did a lot with, um, with the media. We actually used this to inspire our community. There was a New York City medical mission. Uh, this was a press release that we put out. Uh, really, I think this was on, I wanna say uh, April, uh, something around April 15th or so. And I hope you can read it here that community members were encouraged to come out and cheer and hold up posters along the route of the buses that were leaving the community. And so Cornell University affiliated with New York Presbyterian had two like, you know, huge buses logoed with Cornell. We had, um, I believe the first number of people down was 55 and then other people joined them in a couple of days, we were one week from concept of the mission to deployment. And I remember telling our public health director, our, our, our PR director, a public relations vice president, that I wanted roads lined with people with signs to cheer them on. And our community needed to do that. That was actually a very important uh, thing to do. Um, got quotes from the Cornell University president. We, down, we had uh, pre-made downloadable hero posters that the, the deployers, the heroes that were going toward the danger would be um, uh, cheered and celebrated. Um, the Sheriff's Department, the Ambulance Department, Watkins Glen International Raceway, um, everyone wanted a piece of this um, mission. And so upper left, um, you can't see right behind me, that was Representative Reed, the chair, from right to left, myself, Representative Reed, the chairman of our board, the Ithaca mayor, the, uh, our state legislature, when the buses pulled out, they were followed and accompanied, um, you know, really out of Tompkins County. There were people 25 miles out of the city who were lined up along the route to cheer them and thank them. And um, I mean, everybody felt just super about this. Um, fire department hung the American flag. Uh, people, family came out. It was almost like a military deployment where families said goodbye. And there was a sense of these individuals actually, um, uh, you know, being under some amount of danger and going into the uncertain. And so I think everybody was uh, really emotional and it, it motivated our community. These are a picture lower right of the individuals who were um, sending video clips from the bus ride down. Upper left is the nurses outside New York Presbyterian um, just doing a fantastic job. And then just some clips of the individuals um, who were um, uh, lining the, the roadway. I do wanna stop for a second and um, share a different screen and just show you a little clip that hit the news. And I share this just to show you uh, the, the motivation that's necessary to get the community behind um, leadership. So hopefully you can see that and I'll start playing it.
So I'm going to reshare. I'm going to, again, the most uh, difficult part of the, the presentation. Can you guys see my presentation again? Amanda, can you see that okay? Yes, I can. Okay, great. So when we accomplished that, that was, again, that was seven days in planning for from inception to deployment, seven days for people to know about that, um, let their families know that they were going to go down for over a, a month, and then to coordinate that, that they would actually get down to New York, be uh, oriented in a new hospital, and then deployed on a, you know different COVID units in different roles. And it wasn't just New York Presbyterian, it was Lower Manhattan Hospital. It was uh, quite the operation, and a lot of uh, individuals did a a fantastic job of actually making that happen operationally. But at the, the larger level, the way we rolled that out and, and communicated that, that was um, mobilizing the community in the fight against COVID. And I think everyone felt like they were a part. Every person who got a chance to go out appreciated it. The firemen felt good. The police felt good. The Cornell community felt good. And we really just needed that. At the exact same time, the buses were pulling out of Tompkins and we were setting up mass testing. And um, the, uh, I, I put on red there, can you tell which was a military operation? Um, the true story, we were a more efficient operation than the military uh, sites because I was actually in charge of the military sites and I knew what they were doing and where they were operating in, in the state. And um, they, were, um, they had nothing on the Cayuga operation. So the upper left was our operation. We had the ability to actually run six lanes uh, it was built for well over a thousand tests a day. Um, again, um, it was uh, put in an industrial location. We coordinated rapidly with the shops at Ithaca, which is the Ithaca Mall. Uh, and again, the, the lower uh, picture is a, um, a, a picture of the site from Long Island, which was a military operation. But I believe we were within the first week of testing uh, in the state. And so we were very proud to, to do that. Other ways we mot motivated the community is we made very clear how people could help. We were not above asking for help. And the gentleman in the upper right hand most picture is uh, the director of our foundation. We put him in, in, in direct charge of just coordinating giving to our healthcare heroes. So lunches, food, PPE, equipment, um, people donating bed and breakfast for people being put on quarantine that healthcare providers would not, you know, not be going home to their family, uh, all sorts of uh, generosity. Then manufacturing, uh, we um, took over the um, gym at Barton, uh, Bartels Hall, not Barton, at Cornell, and we had volunteer um, sewers in the community making ultimately over 100,000 masks. And here again, people were um, helpless. They didn't know how to help and giving them avenues to either celebrate healthcare heroes, healthcare workers, essential workers, or actually taking part in something uh, was really helpful. Later, this would be the core of our volunteers for our vaccination effort. And I just put this up there. It really, there's been so many parallels between the community and society's response to World War II, uh, particularly in the manufacturing of the COVID-19 pandemic. But I just thought that this shot of um, a makeshift manufacturing effort was very similar to uh, the, the you know, new workers coming out into the workforce um, during World War II. At the same time, we were collecting samples. We started sending our samples to the Mayo Clinic. We were actually building scientific capability. This is the uh, Rionix workstation that was really uh, not FDA approved for COVID. We installed it in our hospital pending um, EUA approval. Uh, it was really for um, uh, pathogen testing in beer and beverages. It was uh, not um, in the, the human medical uh, industry. And we made a deal, this is a, an Ithaca-based company that we would teach them how to interface with hospital uh, electronic health records if they would give us machines at a discounted rate, and they did. And so they learned to uh, interface with human systems. We had access to the capacity, um, and it was a great partnership. Um, certainly, um, the lab testing that was going on um, parlayed right into the vaccination. We were commended by distributing all of our vaccinations at a high rate. Um, we went as aggressive into vaccinations as we, as we did with um, uh, lab testing. Um, we were recognized for this. Um, this is a picture I was uh, celebrating our 50,000th uh, 50, vaccination um, outside the uh, Sears building where 
that sign that says heroes work here, it usually said Sears, but Sears moved out and closed. And the, um, the uh, piece on the right was in The Economist. So we were the most efficient vaccine operation in January in, I would maybe say the United States. We, were, uh, we built our operation to flow um, between 1,000 and 2,000 vaccines per day. Um, we had 25 stations set up. We used volunteers liberally. Um, we had, again, um, uh, health, healthcare, retired healthcare workers, um, volunteering physicians, um, all sorts of uh, pharmacy technicians, and no one in the practices was competing with giving vaccines. They were all behind the unified response. And so in terms of the results, this is our data dashboard. We've tested about 1.73 million people. I think I snipped this um, uh, yesterday. We've vaccinated, this isn't the total number vaccinated, but we've delivered 58,000 vaccinations. Again, the counties are about 100,000 individuals. This isn't counting the individuals who accessed vaccine from uh, the pharmacies or the state systems. And um, by any metric you um, can judge Tompkins County, it was at the top of that, whether it's per capita mortality, per capita infections, um, hospitalizations, um, uh, intubations per capita, uh, we did super well. And it was the combination of obviously ultimately vaccinations, but before that testing and a swift public health response that the entire community got behind. We were very proud to be the fifth most vaccinated, again, per capita community in the country uh, behind the ones listed there. This was uh, caught and this was uh, really a, um, a validation of all the aggressive work we did uh, over the past year. But uh, again, we really have a, um, a wonderful medical community, uh, very cohesive set of organizations. Uh, and I think the secret was to set some fairly aggressive goals out of our lane in terms of our job being reactivating the community and then in a unified way um, uh, working toward it, going way out of the box and getting support along the way. So my summary is, and summary and recommendations for those who are interested in developing uh, as a leader, uh, look for your own functional development uh, definition of leadership and, uh, and also for opportunities. And I think uh, leadership opportunities exist everywhere if you can recognize them. And they are rarely paid at first. Um, it is an investment. Um, but it's a muscle that you need to um, exercise. Um, it's about making decisions and solving for problems that are important, certainly when dealing with a crisis. The, the tempo of the problems and the, the ramifications and the fulminant nature of what you're dealing with is what defines a crisis. And then I believe transparency by the leader around that vision and about the dependence on others um, is critical. So. That's the end of my formal comments. I'm going to uh, switch off the uh, screen sharing and hopefully we can have some discussion. Um, I think um, I can go right into um, Dr. Um, what well, one individual, I, I won't out anyone, asked about, you know, what are the lessons that we've learned? And I would say, and I, I want to, um, you know, hear others' opinions on this, but one lesson is to go outside of our lane a little bit more. I think that a healthcare institution really has an instrumental role in society. Uh, it has a role in, in preparedness, emergency preparedness. Uh, it's got a role in allowing businesses to happen. It's just that we never saw it in such a dramatic way. Uh, and I think that the partnerships that we forged will continue, at least in Tompkins County. Um, dependencies are okay to have as long as they're constructive. And I think that, um, again, hopefully the next challenge like COVID will be a tighter community to respond quicker without having to rebuild those connections. So again, thank you for the opportunity and um, maybe we can have some questions or discussions. Thank you so much, Marty. I appreciate that. It was a very good talk. I have a question from Dr. Patel uh, from uh, NASA. He's the New York ACP uh, counselor from NASA district. Um, he's, he's, he's talking about how you were able to, to uh, get the community to engage and how um, uh, in the future we can get them to tackle chronic health issues like diabetes and hypertension, obesity, and et cetera? I think a couple of things. I think um, health systems need to take the lead in this. As healthcare reform happens, I think there's an opportunity to engage payers and employers to accomplish population health and have a unified message around it. So that's our strategy in Tompkins County. So I think um, when 
the payment systems um, reward accomplishing those things and employers are given value propositions by virtue of the plans that they buy, whether they're traditional commercial plans or self-insured plans, I think we're gonna move in that direction. But health systems, um, I think need to take a lead and uh, bring these things up. I think that um, the, the counter argument to the fact that we did so well in COVID is that we had a fundamentally healthy community which still reflects credit back onto the healthcare system here. But I think that our, our goal should be upstream and not being reactive. I mean, I, I don't wanna judge us as reacting to a, um, a crisis. I think we want to build resilience and health that can withstand the next crisis and have some reserves. So good question. And I hope that was a reasonable answer. Thanks, Marty. I, I have a question for you. Uh, there's no doubt that the, the, the pandemic had caught us off guard, but um, um, we really came up, came up big. Do you think we're ready now? Um, hopefully never something like this at this scale happens, but do you think we're well prepared for any future similar uh, events? Yeah, I mean, there's been, uh, I, yes, um, our society adapts pretty well and um, it was watching water boil, but we really did things as a society so amazingly and rapid. Um, the mRNA platform for the vaccines was miraculous. Um, I would say the uh, really the response of the supply chains um, were also very meritorious and taught the nation a lesson on international dependencies on supply chains. So for instance, so I think these are lessons and capabilities. I guess the, the vaccine platforms are a capability and the lesson is maybe don't get too lean because there's some future scenarios where uh, extreme leanness in supply chains are not good. But I, I do think that will do better the next time around. You know, that which doesn't kill us makes us stronger is a true statement. Um, you know, lest we forget, World War II threw off uh, advantage for the U.S. stemming from, um, you know, a grave worldwide challenge for 50 years following that conflict. And I believe that, you know, this will ultimately make us stronger if we have the political wherewithal to use um, this event constructively. Uh, thank you, Marty. We have a question from Nilar uh, from New York City. Um, she's asking about your opinion on PPE, PPE supply. As a physician from New York City Hospital, I really feel like mass manufacturing of healthcare equipment and protective tools needs to be more efficient from ahead of time as a third year resident. Yeah, no, I think I, this is one of the things that are, uh, <laughs> it's a question for our manufacturing sector of our economy, starting from the capability to actually manufacture access to the raw materials and intellectual property, et cetera, um, to how we actually stress hospitals into being more and more lean. So I think I think it's, it's a supply chain question. I think there is cooperative, this is a great place for government. This is a great place to actually have um, stockpiles that make sense and that um, don't go bad. I mean, uh, just remember the, um, the the lack of clarity around ventilator supply and that the national stockpile wasn't as robust and capable uh, as it was thought to be. And, um, you know, basic things, I mean, uh, basic things in our lives, forget about healthcare, but just food supply, um, uh, shipping uh, constraints, um, transportation constraints, these are uh, real important things for government to talk about. So yeah, I think it can be done a lot better. This is a great role for the Hospital Association of New York. It's a great role for um, Department of Health um, and ultimately payers need to fund it. When So in that Sears building that we did the vaccine operations, we had $1 million of inventory sitting there. We have $1 million of inventory, just $1 million of goods sitting there. So. That came out of Hyde and we're not a big health system. So across all of the hospitals, I'm sure there's a hundred million dollars of inventory that we ultimately accomplished by the end of the, the crisis. Well, who's funding that? Where, where did that come out of the, the healthcare budget and the premium dollars? So there's a lot of questions that are constructed for the system to, um, to, to contemplate. What is your response to those concerned with the increased cases of death and mortality associated with the vaccine? Um, 13 cool to study. Yeah, uh, my understanding, again, I'm not, um, I'm, I'm not neck deep on the, the outcomes research from the vaccine experience was that the risk to benefit ratio is 
strongly in favor of the vaccine in all age um, categories that have been approved thus far, meaning 12 and beyond. So uh, my response with the increased cases of death and morbidity, I, you know, I, I think there are going to be um, side effects and there are going to be uh, adverse events, but uh, comparing it with unvaccinated is, um, again, strongly in favor of encouraging the vaccine in every patient population that I'm aware of. And again, the rationale for re-releasing the J&J &J was effectively the risk for clotting from wild type COVID was greater than the risk of clotting in the vaccinated subgroup that was afflicted. And that's a, a very interesting uh, and assuring statistic that uh, hopefully this group can appreciate. Absolutely. Do we have any other questions? May I unmute and ask a question since I'm driving between two facilities? Go for yeah, it. Go ahead. Awesome. So, you know what I realized? I'm, I'm a new attending in Syracuse at Krauss and uh, teaching in upstate. So, as a second year attending, as you can imagine, it was a, a actually first year attending, it was a rough um, transition. What I realized is that, you know, uh, some parts of the um, society are used to or at least trained in crisis response, such as the military or the DHS or HHS. Um, but maybe the private side or the civilian side, not as much. So from this pandemic, are there going to be any programs that allow such future sort of training in an ongoing fashion for the non-organized um, sectors for leadership for crisis management, you think? Yep. Because that's no, what I've been thinking about, right? Like if this happens again, I'll probably be hopefully in a position to help in a more strong uh, fashion. But where do you get the training from or experience from? Yes. Um, so I, I, first of all, I want to just, great question. I, I, I do want to encourage that, again, the leadership skills, first order leadership skills can be done in committee work in any hospital. There's problems to solve that involve uh, inspiring people to change what they do. And uh, it's hard work. And so I think in every institution throughout uh, the state, uh, there's opportunities to actually um, uh, use your leadership muscles and um, it, it takes time and an investment. And one of the things that I see and regret is where people um, restrict themselves to only that which they're paid for after they come out of training where there was so much sacrifice, so much investment, and then they restrict themselves um, uh, and, and don't give themselves an opportunity to take on challenges that um, are really learning experiences. So that um, is my first point. Um, so keep that in mind. Second, with respect to the, the interface between DOD, military, state, military, and DOH, um, I don't think we handled it the right way. And I was um, overruled. I think that um, the way the state rolled out and used military resources to actually deliver vaccine was a wasted opportunity to have the military work with hospitals and coordinate a response that would then in future crises activate um, a civilian a medical workforce. And if you think about the organic military medical assets, um, it's not impressive, all right? And, and the military struggled with having uh, vaccinators and they had to train people to be vaccinators. And here there were um, health systems like ours. I mean, I, um, in my capacity, could not get uh, New York State National Guard to come in and help direct our activities and augment what we were already doing. So I, I, I'm going to keep working on that. And I think a, a, a vision would be uh, the military providing infrastructure, but Department of Health hospitals, healthcare providers in the state plugging into that infrastructure in a coordinated way. And the cross fertilization would uh, be very instructive. Um, so, I mean, my experience has been in deployable hospitals, um, uh, EMEDS units, and um, I saw the way mobile tent operations work. That's what I did as a military administrator. And to give that experience and perspective to other physicians with joint operations would be very valuable for the state. That would enhance the applicability and the, um, the deployability, even domestically, of uh, medical resources. So good question. I hope we can get there, but right now, um, Government's very siloed. I could just, that's my criticism of how we acted. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that perspective because 
as a civilian, I think I saw that gap, um, especially when we were writing this article on ventilator, ventilator reallocation. So yep. going forward, if you are working on something on the military civilian interface side, I would love to uh, coordinate with you because I think that's something that stuck out to me this time yeah. around. Yeah, um, it was good economics too, like the idea. Um, so when the state gave us vaccine, uh, besides giving us the vaccine and maybe the Medicaid program paying for an administration fee, it was free. The cost of the state-run site, if you looked at the operation, so I go into these operations and I, I look around on what it takes, they had you know, somewhere between 50 and 100 people uh, on orders, either from employed by the Department of Health, the nurses giving the vaccines were paid inflated rates relative to what health systems pay nurses to give the vaccine. So all around, dollar per vaccine, the state would have been much better in using the hospital resources. Now, the counter argument is that they wanted to preserve the hospital focus on hospitalization, and that is a fair counter argument. But I think from an economic perspective, if they were able to let health systems give vaccine, we, we cost the state zero dollars per vaccine allocated, other than what was paid administration from Medicaid payers. So Varen, if that's, I uh, hope I'm pronouncing your name right, just um, feel free to email me and I'll keep you uh, in the loop. Awesome, will do, thank you. Yep. All right, I didn't see if there's any other questions. Oh, let me ask you this, uh, Marty. Um, uh, one of the big company CEOs in the past, uh, I believe it's uh, the, uh, the previous CEO of Amazon said, the chief executives make very few yet high impact decisions. And um, during that rough time with, with, the, with, the, with the pandemic, did it ever cross your mind that you could make a, 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 a mistake, a high impact decision that's wrong? Um, and uh, what are you afraid of negative feedback from your uh, teams? It's, it's, it's high, emotions are high. People have fear, people are afraid. Uh, uh, you know, you come to work, you, you don't know what you're facing. Yeah. No, I was, I was going back in the, um, the presentation. There was, you, you might have seen, a, I'm going to just share my screen really fast because I thought about that. Um, I thought about that a lot. So if you can see my screen really fast, I put this math equation up there. That was um, me talking about showing my work and showing my rationale um, to a fault. I shouldn't say to a fault, but uh, to an excessive extent, I would tell people what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, what, I'm, what my objectives were, what I'm hoping to accomplish, and nothing was a secret. And so I, I call it increasing the surface area on a decision. And um, I had my entire leadership team and constantly asking people, double check me if I'm wrong, tell me. Um, if that's the case, then uh, we would change paths. But yes, um, when we sent people down to New York City, a criticism was, you know, we're, we're, what if the wave hit us at that time? What if we needed those resources and they were down in New York? By the way, we gave ventilators, we, we drove ventilators down to them as well. We gave supplies, we brought supplies and PPE at a time where what if those ventilators were needed in Ithaca? And so again, the, the argument, and I said this out loud as well, we're getting experience we wouldn't otherwise get. And we're, um, you know, we're able to get, you know, training and there's a humanitarian need and, um, New York Presbyterian and other ideas, they, they, they did pay us for those individuals and that those were fewer people we needed to furlough. People don't realize every hospital in upstate New York greatly contracted its workforce. So before we did that, I called Representative Reed. I said, you know, I'm calling Tom. I said, sir, do you know that we're about to furlough people? The governor is talking about building up the workforce. Every hospital executive is decreasing the workforce because the hospitals are empty. Do you know that? And so in time and time again, we were constantly double checking, making sure people knew facts and second guessing ourselves. So yeah, I was terrified along the way. Thank you. And if I'm wrong about my vaccine thing, that might be, that might be true. I, I, uh, that's again, I'm gonna uh, plead the ignorance of an administrator on this respect. All right, do we have any other questions? Any other comments? We have um, five minutes to six o'clock. Uh, we have a few more minutes for any more questions if anyone wanna come up. Um, all right, if no questions, then um, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Stallone for giving us this um, 
a very thoughtful talk, and uh, I think there is maybe a message there. Oh, okay. Oh, so thanks, everyone. Thank you, Marty. And uh, we're looking forward for future uh, activities and meetings. Thank you. I had a question, but oh, we have we have uh, a question. That, okay, go ahead, um, Parveen. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. We hear you. Yes, I was just uh, thinking, you know, that go uh, hearing Dr. Martin's lecture, and uh, I have uh, some experience in public health in various countries. I was just thinking that would the outcome of the pandemic be different if you know there was a cost put to all the services that were provided free of cost in this situation for the virus as opposed to other diseases like diabetes or cancer or any other um, disease does uh, you know the uh, cost effectiveness of this like uh, say anything regarding the outcome, would the outcome would have been different had, um, you know, there was a cost put to vaccines, you know, or to services that were provided free to the public? Um, right. I mean, that, that's ultimately everyone's going to pay from the, the tax impact of that and the economic impact. So. Um, I think there, there is a cost. It's just not charged in the traditional way that medical services are charged. You know, where I thought you were going was, um, you know, talking about um, the cost of the economic shutdown, the cost of the, the isolation quarantine. There, there are different philosophies on how to handle it. And I think part of that um, had to do with the timing of the vaccine and the impact of the vaccine. So I think prospectively it was a reasonable uh, thing to do, but there's debate in that. Um, debating that as well um, in terms of the total cost to society with, you know, the $8 trillion economic impact and, and the, the, mm -hmm. the funds that needed to be flowed. So um, I, I think it would have been a barrier if they are, if hospitals needed to buy supplies and then charge the public for them. I think that would have been a, a, a another level of complexity that we would have dealt with. And so I think in that respect, the government got it right and just paid for it. And They'll figure it out in the long run. Is that what you were asking? Yes, that's what I wanted to know that, I mean, because of all the efforts, the voluntary support and everything from the government to the public and everything, we were able to handle this pandemic. And if we do handle all our healthcare, you know, problems like that, you think we would have a healthier society. That's what I'm thinking. I think it would be a lot less efficient. We were not the most efficient. This was not a steady state operation. So I think that um, the, the moves that were made were made because this was a odd 18 months. And by odd, I mean terrible and horrible and uh, not, not normal. Uh, but I, I, I don't think that that method of putting everything onto the government and letting it ride would work economically. I think our GDP would be harmed in the long run. Oh, okay, thank you. Good question, snuck one in there. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>